Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. I'm looking at my notes. Um, it re it's reminding me to silence my cell phone. I've already turned it off in case you had forgotten to do that. Some of you have been heavy planning today. You may still have your results. Um, thank you all for coming on this lovely day. It's really impressive that we do some dark things for windows to get remember. It's a nice day. I'm Brooke Ackerley. I'm a political science and philosophy and women's and gender studies. And um, I'm the co-founder of the Global Feminism Collaborative, which is your host um, on this sunny afternoon. And it's really an honor for me to be introducing to you all to all of to you today. And once I start to tell you about her and your work, you'll probably be increasingly impatient for her to talk, so I'm going to keep you at bay in suspense for just a moment. Um, I want to tell you a bit about the Global Feminisms Collaborative, um, who's hosting this. We began in the fall of 2006 with funding from the Center for Ethics, and both Susan and Charles are here today. Um, and we're committed to doing transdisciplinary scholarship for social justice and to carrying that out um, at Vanderbilt through uh, these related activities. One is that we sponsor research for social justice, that is research in which the research agenda is developed in collaboration with community or organizations or movement-based partners. And these include in Nashville, the food security partners, the living wage movement, the affordable housing movement, Magdalene and Thistle Farms, and outside of Nashville, the Global Fund for Women, um, which is a grant-making organization uh, based in San Francisco, but gives money to women around the world. We have created a regular weekly space at Vanderbilt for our colleagues, graduate and faculty um, colleagues, to meet together and share their work in progress in the Global Feminism's Brown Bag Series, and Lindy is the one who's been leading that. And in partnership with the Women's Center and the Office for Active Citizenship, we've created occasional spaces for undergraduates to meet with global feminist activists like those that we've brought um, to campus today. And I hope you'll join us at the Community, community Partnership House. I'll make sure I have those words in the right order. Um, the Community Partnership House, which is where Oaks is located after mm -hmm. this, for a reception in which you can meet Sri Lata, who will be giving us our talk today, but also Judy Russ, who's part of our conference this happening tomorrow and the next day will be with us there, and I hope you get to meet her as well. And finally, we are hoping um, for Vanderbilt to be the occasional site of some of the most interesting conversations in feminism today. Um, and today, we begin such, one such conversation about um, social and environmental justice. So we do this work, um, this year, eight of us, next year, 10 of us collaboratively, um, collaboratively among us, but also um, we'd like to thank so many sponsors who make this work possible, and they include the Center for Ethics, the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture, and Erica Johnson's here from that organization. The Commons has been an active sponsor of our work this year, and will uh, be um, hosting a meeting on the effects of the US election that's on women in the world next October. Uh, the Climate Change Research Network, Vanderbilt's regulatory program, both at the law school, um, Women's and Gender Studies, the Center for Medicine, Health, and Society, and the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society are all co-sponsors of this talk today. But as feminists make visible, it takes more than financial resources to do this kind of work. Building community takes people. And I'm particularly grateful to the community of global feminist um, collaborators um, that we have here at Vanderbilt, and particularly today to Sonalini Sapra for making this event, both this talk today and, um, and the workshop that's going to happen over the next two days possible. She is a role model of a feminist teacher, taking her concern that, um, this is Sonalini in the front row blushing, by the way, <laughs> taking her concern that environmental and social justice scholarship had much to learn from the work of feminist activists engaged in these struggles, she thought carefully about who to bring to campus who could best enable those familiar and those new to these questions to be introduced to and then challenged by the issues raised. And Sonalini did a perfect job in bringing to us today Srilata Batuwali. Batuwala, sorry. Um, Srilata is an Indian feminist activist and researcher and a global feminist both intellectually and personally. Um, and that she lives in Bangalore in South India, um, where she was born, in fact, and where her family is based, but that she also spends part of her year in Cambridge, uh, where she is currently the Civil Society Research Fellow at the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations at Harvard. She's also the chair of WEDO, the Women's Environment and Development Organization, an organization 
often central in facilitating women's participation in U.S. sponsored deliberate, U.N. sponsored, um, not U.S. sponsored, <laughs> U.S. <-sponsored laughs> deliberative spaces um, where economic, social, gender justice, um, and a healthy, peaceful planet and human rights are on the agenda. She holds a master's degree in social work from the Tata Institute of Social Science in Bombay. She has produced amazingly influential pieces of work that examine the key themes and strategies of women's activism. For example, in When White Rights Go Wrong, she looks at the rights-based framework as a tool for women's movements. In Taking the Power Out of Empowerment, she reviews the ironic shift of empowerment-based activism from a process that, and the results of a process of transforming the relationships of power between individuals and social groups. And for feminists, the transformation of the relationships, excuse me, the relations of power between men and women within and across social categories of various kinds. Both of, the, both of these papers discourage us from looking for simple answers or the silver bullet, a lesson that we should have in mind as we consider development, gender injustice, and environmental crises. However, what we have learned from Ms. Patulwala's work is that through the silver, though the silver bullet version of empowerment is an emaciated version of a concept, women's movements have figured out ways of empowering women. In the late 80s and 90s, Ms. Butwala was essential in an essential actor in among women in and among women's researchers who were looking outside, working outside of academia, working to make women's empowerment a substantive and realizable goal. Her influential women's empowerment in South Asia, concepts and practices, disseminated those insights, and as we were discussing earlier today, organizations that have mainstreamed gender and empowerment are realizing that their work is lacking the political impetus and that, that the political notion of empowerment had brought to that work originally. Her experience is both academic and field-informed. For nearly 25 years, she worked in India in a range of social change and gender justice activities that spanned grassroots organizing, advocacy, and research, with a deep commitment to gender equality and the women's movement in India. This includes work in an NGO that organized and mobilized um, pavement and slum dwellers, particularly women, to struggle for sustainable, people-centered solutions to their housing and survival needs in an urban context. It also includes being instrumental um, in organizing over 30,000 poor rural women into village-level collectives which fought for changes in their social, legal, and political status. And I should note that that was a government-funded organization, which might seem somewhat ironic to some of us at this moment. Um, she was the South Asia, South Asia coordinator of DAWN. Um, and set and headed the Women's Policy Research and Advocacy Union and at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. And finally, before her current bicontinental arrangement, she was um, the, a program officer at Ford in the Governance and Civil Society Unit based in New York, handling programs related to strengthening international civil society and the nonprofit sector where her current work is um, focused. So throughout this career, she has managed to give clarity to issues that cannot be discussed in simplistic terms. Moreover, she does so in a way that makes those who meet her want to stay and talk a while, and to have her back um, to open our minds and influence our thinking. Please join me in welcoming Sri Lata to talk to us today about the linked paths to social justice and environmental and gender justice. Well, that was a very humbling introduction. Um, it's instilled some fear in me that all the rest will only be a disappointment. So bear with me if I don't quite <laughs> rise up to that, uh, uh, that image. Um, I want to um, begin my talk by first of all thanking uh, Brooke and the whole uh, feminist, global feminist collaboratory uh, for this invitation and this honor of inviting me to uh, be here as part of this process and also uh, to have an opportunity to speak with all of you. They also challenged me in a certain way by giving me this particular topic to talk about 
because I realized that it's been uh, a bit of a while since I've thought about environment and gender justice although this was in a sense a very strong early part of my work some of my earliest work was on looking at uh, women's roles in meeting the rural the energy needs of, of rural households and from that started looking at all the challenges of environmental degradation and the very gendered impacts of those challenges so I've actually worked longer and harder on this talk than I anticipated having to do. And it was a very refreshing opportunity to go back to um, some of the work that I've done, but also to kind of get touch base with some of the, the, the current work that's uh, being done. I just wanted to add to the introduction uh, one little fact, but which is very important to me now and that informs some of this talk as well, which is that for almost nine months now, I've also been working with AWID, the Association for Women's Rights and Development, as a part-time scholar associate. And my work with AWID is called, it's part of an initiative that's called Building Feminist Movements and Organizations. And I'm helping AWID to do some work around what is it going to take to revitalize and uh, re strengthen the movement building focus within uh, feminism and women's organizations more broadly. So that will inform part of the talk. So um, I guess I have about 40 minutes. Um, I will struggle a bit since I have 32 slides, but uh, bear with me because I'm hoping <coughs> that this, oops, I don't know what's happening. Okay, I'm hoping that the slides help me to move along and also for you to have something to focus on. I wanted to start with this quotation from Lao Tzu. I don't usually like quoting military strategists. Um, I'm a bit of a peacenik. Um, but I just really think this is a very, very profound statement for social movements today and for those of us who are interested and committed to building social justice movements. And the statement is, if you don't change direction, you'll end up exactly where you're heading. And th I think that's a fact that all of us need to remember. I have constructed this talk at quite a basic level. So for those of you who find it you know, too elementary and you've already thought about all this stuff, please bear with me. I do apologize because I didn't have a clear sense of at what level to, to pitch it. So I thought it's useful. And my father taught me always begin with the basics. So if we're talking about gender justice and environmental justice, let me tell you what I'm talking about, whether you agree with these definitions or not. So I define gender justice as a process that hopes to eradicate the socially constructed differences between men and women. And the emphasis here should be on the socially constructed and perpetuated differences, which means eliminating all forms of discrimination, exclusion, oppression, and exploitation on the basis of gender and please don't ask me to define what discrimination, exclusion, oppression, and exploitation is and how I differentiate them because you could get me started on that and I could spend a lot of time. But I did think that it was important to touch on two elements of, of this process that are often conflated in discussion, which is equality and equity. And I like to make a distinction between the two because they're very, very important in the context of of gender equality. Ensuring equality is about ensuring sameness. So it means, for instance, in the eyes of the law, you are exactly the same as a man. And every human being is viewed as exactly the same. And their sameness is very important to avoid discrimination. But ensuring equity is really much more about equality in access and opportunity and voice. And as we go on, you will begin to see why 
both equity and equality become very important if we're talking about gender justice, particularly in uh, a context like mine, like, like India's. I also thought it's worth mentioning that gender justice is a process that involves a, a transformation of both gender and social relations. Because when people talk about gender justice, there's a tendency to assume that it's just about men and women. But it's actually about sets of social relations that mediate and intersect with, with gender. So it's about working in favor of women at the most basic level. But it's also about creating greater equality and equity between men and women within the same social group. And finally, and this is the most complex part of the process, it's about creating greater equality and equity between women and men of different social groups. So in my country, the way I would explain this to an audience is it means not just that Dalit women and men should have equal opportunity and equal treatment, for instance, under the law, but that Dalit women should not be sexually made forced to be available to upper caste men because they are Dalit women. So in this context, you might reproduce that in, in, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, and all those other shades of inequality. Now, what, how do I define environmental justice? Uh, it was really interesting because I developed this definition and I wrote it down. And then I actually did a search on the web. And I found uh, the definition created by, uh, it was the first uh, environmental summit of people of color in the United States. And when I went through their statement, I found they pretty much had everything, all these elements, so I felt very affirmed. But I also realized that the gender piece was large, largely missing <laughs> from their perspective, and I'm kind of starting from there. So I define environmental justice as eradicating the inequitable and unsustainable exploitation and use of natural resources, leading to degradation of the Earth's natural environment, it is ensuring that all people have a say in the management of the environment and its resources. But here's the catch. It's ensuring that there is greater voice for those, such as women, who bear a disproportionate share of the impact of environmental degradation. So I'm saying environmental justice actually involves privileging and prioritizing the voices of those who have born the greatest burden of environmental changes. And finally, of course, it means ensuring protection of the survival and the uh, needs of all forms of life. Um, those who can't be at the table, who can't make the conversation, uh, can't be in conversations that make policy. Then I thought it's important to look at what are the links between gender and environmental justice. First of all, uh, as Brooke just referred to in her introduction, I really like to look at things, I like to look at justice in the context of power. Because I think justice is ultimately always about power. It's about the structures of power and the relations of power in any society. So I see the relationship between gender and environmental justice as rooted in social power relations. Secondly, I believe that social power relations determine the ability to access, assert, and realize rights to both gender equality and environmental justice, which is the ability to have a say in how environmental resources are used to have a seat at that decision-making table. So I feel it's important for us to begin by analyzing, or at least for me to present to you, some different ways of thinking about social power and how it mediates access to equity and justice in both the realms of gender and environment. Do you like my little guy, my ringmaster? OK. I define social power 
And this is a definition deeply influenced by the work of many feminists, but particularly my colleague Aruna Rao from Gender at Work. So we look at social power as the differential capacity of individuals and social groups to determine who gets what, how resources are distributed, who does what, the division of labor, who decides what, who influences decision making. But most importantly and most critically and most often forgotten, who is framing the agenda. So if you look at the climate change debate today, for example, and you start to analyze what are the issues that are being highlighted, what are the issues that are being positioned as the most critical ones for the world, you'll see that that setting of the agenda has a particular kind of influence within it. Is it the interests and concerns of more privileged, more developed societies? It would poor women in a tribal area in my country say that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is their top priority in climate change? Maybe not. Maybe they would say afforestation is the most important thing. Now maybe there's a link, but the point is that they can't frame the agenda. And so framing the agenda is a very key part of social power and today, in, in, in the current kind of context we live in, that is becoming a more and more important source of power, the ability to decide what's the agenda. Another way of looking at it, and this is the framework I had used in my earlier work on empowerment, which Brooke referred to, is the differential access to or control over across individuals and social groups of material and natural resources, so land, uh, forest produce, water, and of course um, capital, financial resources. It's the control over human resources. Now if you look at rural, agricultural, small farmer families, you'll find that the labor of women and children is considered, is controlled there, that's a human resource that's controlled by the head of the household. And all their labor, if they're agricultural labor, is controlled by the landlord with uh, the power to employ them. You know? So we have to look at who has control over human resources. In the case of women, there's another dimension to human resources, which is their control over their bodies. Uh, this is freedom from violence, it's reproductive, you know, uh, health and decision-making choices, it's their sexual rights, it's, it's the whole uh, bag that I fit into human resources. Intellectual resources, knowledge, information, access to education, access to new ideas, this is a key resource which determines your place in a social hierarchy. Naila Kabir, uh, a colleague from Bangladesh in her work identified a very important element of social power which she called intangible resources. And intangible resources is being enacted in this room because I'm here because I have this intangible resource that Brooke can know my work. So it's the contacts, it's the influence, it's the networks you're part of, it's who you can talk to, it's who you can call. And these are very critical forms of social power. And I have seen very poor women using this power in very interesting ways uh, once they became aware that this is a form of power. So cultivating a relationship with the local block development officer, with the local health officer, with the local police. Uh, they made a deal, the pavement women I worked with made a deal with the local police station that if there was too much drinking and domestic violence by their men, could they call them, just lock them up for the night because he should go to work the next day, otherwise I lose income. So these were the sort of deals they struck using this intangible resource of the trust they built with the local police. Finally, of course, it's the power and the privilege and the authority to make decisions. Now, social power, 
actually has at least three forms. Maybe there are others that you would add to this list, but these are the three that I like to look at. Direct power is the most obvious form of power and it's the one we've all experienced. Like when you're a kid, it's time to go to bed. And you have, that's the power that others have over you and it's the power to make others do what you want. Indirect power is a little more subtle. It's the power to influence others' actions and options without giving direct orders. We see this all the time in Indian villages in the practice of caste, for instance. How did caste ideologies get perpetuated? It's not that the upper castes had to actively stand and forbid lower caste people from entering a temple, for instance, or using their water we uh, well. It was a, 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 a kind of a social understanding, a social contract that was hammered out over centuries, perhaps initially through force, but it's really a form of indirect power where you know the others are not going to cross that line. Because of course there's a threat of violence, there's a threat of reaction, but it's the capacity to influence other people's choices without giving direct orders. And women understand this very deeply. It's, it's something we enact in our homes, in our lives constantly. We are, we are, we are performing responsibilities and tasks that's, that no one can say, I forced you to wash the dishes. But if you don't wash the dishes, the dishes don't get washed. So, you know, there's a way in which the gender division of labor, etc., operates through indirect power. And finally, of course, a gender setting power, which I've already uh, referred to. Now, in my context, here are some of the ways in which gender power gets mediated. It never operates in and of itself. It operates through class. So, as an upper class, urban educated woman, my privileges as a woman are different from and greater than a woman who is a domestic worker in my house, who's poor, she's working class, she's from a lower caste. Race operates. The northeastern people uh, in, in, in the northeastern part of our country, or at least of the subcontinent, they would argue that it's not part of our country, uh, have always been treated uh, with a lot of racism. You know, they're, they're jungle people, they're tribals, they're, you know, uh, very much the way perhaps black people were treated in an earlier era in, in the U.S. Ethnicity, age, marital status, ability for women, actually age and marital status are very important determinants of your power, even as a woman. Because if you're older, if you're married, you have much more power and much more say even in household, even if it's constrained within the household than others. Location is very important, not only in terms of urban and rural, but north and south in India. Uh, north and south in the world. If you're a woman from the north and a woman from the south, you're definitely having a very different level of influence on processes. There are historical variables and so on and so forth. So I won't, I won't labor these, but we can talk about these in, in, in the discussion if it interests you. But I thought I would just illustrate how gender power actually operates um, and to create and perpetuate gender inequality. And we could pick two or three of these and, and just look at them during the discussion hour. But these are all forms that manifest the deeply embedded nature of gender discrimination and inequality in, in our society. And one of them which has become really tricky, especially for feminists today, is that uh, we are facing one of the worst sex ratios in the world. The sex ratio, are you familiar with, with the term sex ratio, right? That normal sex, sex ratios, normal, that is in societies where there isn't active or violent discrimination against women and deprivation of equality of access to food and healthcare and education and so on, the sex ratio should be somewhere around 1,050 to 1,070 females per 1,000 males. 
this is how I, I will sound uh, very essentialist if I say this, but this is how nature ordained it because the survival of the species depended much more on there being a large pool of, of, of uh, women. But in our country, uh, not only is the national figure now around 9, 919 or 920 per 1,000 births, which means that there are approximately uh, 150 women missing for every thousand men, um, but it is uh, uh, the sex ratio has declined to as low as 450 and 500 women per thousand men in some parts of the country, in some districts. And part of this has occurred in the last, this transition has occurred in the last 15 or 20 years when sex selection technologies have become available and has led to, you know, sort of mass uh, uh, aborting of female fetuses. Now, how do you tackle this as a gender justice issue without becoming anti-reproductive rights, uh, making it an anti-abortion issue? So it's a very tricky uh, place to go. And what uh, a, a lot of us are thinking about is, how do we shift the focus back onto the root cause of this phenomenon, which is the predominance and the perpetuation of sun preference? And then, you know, uh, the fact that even with all the modernization and all the um, government policies, sun preference tends to persist. And because of sun preference, you not only have this low sex ratio with the actual death of, of girl children, but you have a kind of very low grade persistent deprivation in access to food, in education, in healthcare, etc. And there are multiple um, studies mm, that establish that. Um, I'm coming now to environmental decision making and I didn't want to call it environmental power because it's not quite that. It's about the power to make decisions that affect uh, the environment. And again, you find that there are many commonalities between the factors that determine access to this power and that keep you away from it. And of course, gender is one because if you are a woman and you uh, must remember, and I come to this in a later slide, the environment movement, including in countries like mine, was a movement largely built by technical experts, by scientists, who were studying this stuff and coming up with the data, and then latterly, largely by male social activists. So it's a movement that has tended to be very gender blind, or in fact gender discriminatory, and has tended not to imagine that women need to be at the table uh, when important discussions around policy and conservation me measures and sustainability programs are being designed. But in the environmental arena, what is much more important is how state and global institutions, the differential levels of power between state and global institutions, and state, I mean national institutions versus global institutions, so national governments versus global institutions like the World Bank or the WTO, if the WTO enforces the lowering of environmental standards in developing countries in order to permit uh, freer trade uh, arrangements, fr a freer investment environment, for instance, or the export of hazardous production methods to uh, southern countries, then this, the national government's capacity to resist those environmentally damaging uh, and technologies is, is reduced. So here there's, there's a big imbalance. And of course, there are the global hierarchies. The North-South, the fact that the US won't sign the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, you have international agreements which give a certain amount of power, including to civil society and, and women's movements if they choose to use it. And natural disasters have been found to have a very interesting and unsettling effect on decision making over, uh, for instance, sustainable reconstruction and, and, and so on. So it's interesting to look at how 
how that power operates. Again, in this slide, I'm going to just pick one of, of the many issues I've recorded for you. I hope, Brooke, there'll be a way, way of sharing this PowerPoint with everybody if they have interest. I'm sure the center can, the collaboration can put it up on its website or something. But if you look at how the power operates in creating environmental injustice, the most classic example is the Indian Forest Act because this act was uh, promulgated around 1850 or 1860, perhaps a little bit later. But what the Indian Forest Act did, and mind you, that was uh, a legislation passed during the time of British colonial rule, but that has only been strengthened and reinforced post-independence. I mean, you would imagine one of the things we could have done after India obtained independence was to either dismantle the Forest Act or completely reframe it. But it didn't happen because the Forest Act essentially empowered the state to take control. At that time, it was the British state, and now it's the Indian state, to take control of India's forests. And by doing so, what they did was disempower the traditional stewards of the forests who were the tribal forest dwelling communities. And although there, there are some arguments on the margins, by and large, forest dwelling tribal people had very good methods of making sure that forests were regenerated. They had good ways of using forest produce in a very sustainable way. And that has been destroyed. Tribal people have been largely driven out of forests, settled in the plains. They don't know cultivation. They fail as agriculturalists. They become indebted, they become bankrupt. A lot of them migrate to the cities and become wage laborer in, in the cities or remain as uh, uh, wage slaves in, in, in rural areas. Now let's look at the real links between uh, 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 gender justice and environmental justice. I'm making a case now for why it is that poor women pay the price for environmental injustice and for environmental degradation. First of all, with degrading environments, the, there are new forms of divisions of labor that emerge, but also old forms of gender divisions of labor that persist and uh, reproduce themselves. So for example, women in a rural area in my country and in many parts of the world are still responsible for getting biomass cooking fuel because they cannot afford kerosene and there is no other alternative. They are still responsible for finding fodder and grazing lands for livestock by and large. They are primarily responsible for getting water supply not only for drinking but for other basic needs of the household. And in many countries, they are also responsible for growing or gathering certain kinds of foods like vegetables, greens, fruit, and so on at opportunity cost or growing them in small patches of land that they have control over. Now with uh, distances, with the growing deforestation, with growing desertification, etc., all these tasks are still falling on women but they are becoming harder and harder to do. And there's no shift that we are able to see in the division of labor. Women lack ownership and property rights in my country. Even though there has been a lot of legal reform in that respect, the fact is that by and large, even if women are formal owners on title deeds, they do not control decision making about the use of land. And one of the stories I'm going to tell you will illustrate how that pans out. So women can't really take decisions, for instance, to switch to more organic methods of farming because it's not the decision that they can take because they don't own the land. They, so there's this whole lack of decision making power, although women persistently, because I don't want to keep making poor women look like victims, they are absolute masters of sub subversive forms of resistance and subversive ways of finding spaces and negotiating some opportunities to take control every now and then. Poor women also pay the price because access to natural resources and environmental services have been greatly reduced by all these processes that I'm sure you're familiar with. There's been a closing of the commons. 
So it's harder and ra harder to find common lands on which to graze. There is privatization of land. India, in my state, Karnataka, has recently repealed laws that prohibited uh, uh, foreign companies from buying land, from foreign uh, builders from buying land and speculating uh, with land in, in, in India was very difficult because we had laws that you had to have citizenship to buy land. And many states enacted laws that said you had to be a resident of that state to buy land. And today, all those laws are being repealed. So people are moving in large scale. And I don't know if you know about a very famous, uh, old, famous in certain circles, but little known movement, which is the anti-golf course movement. Have you ever heard of this? This had its headquarters in the Philippines. But the, we are soon going to have anti-golf course movements spreading to India because huge tracts of rural land are being bought by private companies for setting up spas and golf courses and resorts and so on. So there's a process of water usage and land alienation that's going to create huge amounts of social friction. And since women have no voice in any of this, even at the policy level, it's very hard. And women's movements don't even necessarily see some of these things as women's issues, to get in there, to get to those policy spaces and join these kinds of struggles. Of course, you're all familiar with war and conflict-related displacement and the terrible things that have happened to women in Darfur and Somalia and other places in just simply going out of refugee camps to gather firewood for their cooking. They've been raped, they've been killed. There's also the phenomenon of ecological uh, refugees. Uh, what in India, we used to call ecological refugees people who can no longer survive in the rural environment because of the uh, uh, desertification, the degradation of land, soil degradation. So even if they own land in rural areas, they don't have access to water. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that there's been a transition in the last few years in India where it's no longer in a rural setting, land holding that determines your economic power, it's water that determines your economic power. So you can own 10 acres of land, and if you don't have water you're, and you cannot cultivate uh, uh, in a in a, in a you know sort of secure way, you are as poor as a Dalit landless laborer. So water is increasingly becoming the uh, the benchmark. Um, there are also very serious health hazards and health impacts on women that are very particular to them of environmental changes. One of the common ones, which I'll touch on from this list, is that because women walk very long distances to bring firewood, and I'm sure you've seen pictures of women carrying huge loads of firewood on their head. And there have been actual studies that have established that sometimes they're carrying almost their body weight, and sometimes even a little over their body weight in, in, in firewood, because there's such a desperate search for cooking fuel. They suffer very high rates of uterine prolapse because of this head loading, because of carrying these disproportionate loads on their heads. And there are a whole range of other things. The best documented one is the high levels of respiratory disease that occur in women and girl children. Because when you use biomass cooking fuels in, 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 in indoor cooking situations, the air pollution is worse than it's 200 times the toxicity of uh, uh, 20 packets of cigarettes. So it's, it's, it's possibly the most toxic indoor environment, be, which beats even the most hazardous of chemical industries and um, worker safety standards. So that's a, a, a huge set of issues. And if nothing else, this is a key location where environmental justice becomes a gender issue because this is one of the key sites of the disproportionate burden that women bear. Women also have a lack of access to new ideas and information and technology. In our country, sometimes it's a simple function of literacy. 
Although our literacy levels have improved according to official statistics, there are still districts in India, including districts I've worked in in the Women's Empowerment Program, where the literacy level among women was 12 percent. 15 percent. So you had 85, 90 percent of women couldn't read and write. You also have, and this is a critical issue that I want to come to now, is the fact that women are either invisible or instrumentalized when it comes to environmental justice. They are invisible as potential agents of change. But in the eyes of environment movements, we do, my organization is working desperately right now and I would invite you to visit the website and see, uh, we do statement on gender and climate change. They are desperately working to get all the climate change groups to take on gender as a central issue and to take on the fact that climate change does not impact equally on men and women. And I can tell you, it's hard. It's a struggle, even to get those environmental movements to take this seriously. Government and international agencies, they love women, they love gender, but always as a means. Always because if you do it through <coughs> women, it'll get done, it'll be efficient, and they'll do the job, you know, they'll soldier on reliably. Not because it's a matter of justice, not because they want to hear women's analyses and women's perspectives and their constructions of the problem, of the solution, <coughs> of being part of the designing of the solution, no. It's the delivery. They are the delivery system for every intervention. So they are really instrumentalized. And if you look at the environmental justice discourse at large, you don't find very, uh, uh, a, a very clear gendered analysis coming through it at all. These are just some examples I put together of the uh, impacts of environmental changes on women and why it is a gender issue. And I just wanted to draw your attention to the second one, which goes back to the example I gave about head loading, that women in the state of Gujarat, one of the studies um, I looked at, um, women in this state in, in one part of the state were found to be spending four to five hours a day collecting fuel wood. This is a very salinated, uh, semi-arid region of Gujarat. But their mothers, and this is the way I always did my, my research studies, I would say, was dowry given or taken at your mother's marriage, at your grandmother's marriage, at your marriage, and will you have to give it for your daughters? And you'll always see the art going like this. The graph goes up like that. And this is the same story with, with the fuel wood. You, if you talk to these women, you'll see that maybe their, their mothers may have spent a, an hour or th two or three hours once every three or four days or five days collecting firewood. And now they're having to do it every single day. And it's going further and further. And it's worse and worse um, quality. Moving on, I have some other. Uh, points, but I, I'm going to try and save time. I'm trying to rush and finish by five. I don't think it'll work. Um, okay, let me see if I can go back. Yeah, yeah, actually, this is an important slide because it comes to how social movements are dealing with this. Another set of reasons why poor women are paying the price is actually related to how uh, major movements, uh, both environmental and gender justice movements, are dealing with their discourse or with their uh, issues. Um, at we do, looking around at who can be allies with us in building the whole gender and climate change campaign, we realized that there are hardly any international women's organizations that have stayed focused on the environment. There are a handful. You can count them on the fingers of one hand. So this is not an issue that women's movements, women's organizations, uh, certainly at the transnational level, and feminist movements, but really least of all, have really taken on board as a very serious and central uh, issue of gender justice. 
Secondly, there is a kind of a hierarchization, if I could, you know, use that word that actually doesn't exist. But if you if you were to put the issues within women's and uh, women's movements into a hierarchy, you would find that the hierarchy of issues is often a reflection, and I'm saying something very controversial, please feel free to challenge me on this. They are often a reflection, though sometimes in a very subconscious way, of the class character of the leadership, of the people who shape, who frame the agenda, if you remember that slide, who frames the agenda, an agenda setting power. The agenda setting power in these contexts does not usually lie with the vast majority of poor women who are bearing the burdens of environmental changes. But it is a set of people whose perhaps definition of the issues, even on behalf of poor women, is quite different. So the, in that hierarchy, gender and environment, it's very low down if it's there at all. You know, it's not really seen. Maybe poverty, yes, would be higher up on the, on the list, but you cannot, and it is dangerous, in fact, to tackle poverty even in a very gendered way without factoring in environmental justice because you end up reproducing interventions that result in further degradation. This is happening in South Africa, for instance, with women struggling to support families with the you know, huge devastating impact of, of the AIDS epidemic, trying to do cultivation on marginal lands where the soil is already deeply, deeply degraded. So they're highly dependent on more chemicals, more pesticides, more of the very things that have <coughs> degraded the soil in the first place. And nobody's talking to them about planting nitrogen fixing plants, for instance, to, to regenerate the soil. Nobody's talking to them about organic because it's quick results. We have to get them to have some kind of secure income. So it's a very well-intentioned anti-poverty intervention, but it's creating devastating um, and environmental effects, which are going to impact those very women in a very short period of time. So in other social movements, not women's movements, but say environmental justice movements, labor movement, uh, land rights movements, anti-dam movement, or whatever, again, it's likely that many of these uh, um, formations are uh, often led by men who would be absolutely outraged if they were accused of being gender blind, but in practice tend to treat gender as add women and stir. And they don't see a, 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 a gendered lens, a, a, a gendered analysis as very fundamental to shifting their paradigm. You know, so they think it's it, the paradigm's fine, and now let's just put women in here, 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 and here. And they are often the most resistant to ceding space at the agenda setting table to not just women, but to poor women. So they will often in these movements say, you know, small and marginal farmer movements. <coughs> I know of only one in my country, and in my country is absolutely. Uh, a, a treasure trove of movements and NGOs and every possible phenomenon. We have every possible problem in the world, so we have every possible movement in the world. And the, there is only one that has shifted, a small and marginal farmer movement that has shifted its paradigm. And that's because the wife of one of the f people who, who, who started this movement is a feminist. So from the very beginning, Gail Omvit brought this gendered lens to this work, and they built women's leadership into this process from day one. And so this whole movement of drought-affected small and marginal farmers has a very gendered view of the problem. But that's a rarity. So that's another phenomenon that I think ends up with poor women paying the price. And finally, I think the northern discourse, and I'm sorry to say including the sort of more progressive discourse on hot uh, environmental issues, whatever is the issue of the day, and currently it's climate change, they do largely tend to ignore 
uh, they don't, they're not even informed by, because I don't think most of them subject themselves to a process of being informed by uh, poor women's priorities and perspectives. And to be fair, are there really movements on the ground at the grassroots in, in any of our countries that have built this kind of alternate paradigm from women's eyes, from women's voices. I'm not so, so sure. So I'm not even sure that if these guys opened up the space at the table or opened the northern discourse suddenly had a humbling epiphany and said, I have to go and talk to poor women out there and figure out what they think. There has to be somebody at that other end to participate in that dialogue. And I'm not sure many of us, this goes back to the women's movements, I'm not sure many of us have done that work. There are a few, but not that many. Can women make a difference? OK, I am not going to go through this entire list, because I think by now I've made my uh, position on this quite clear. But I did want to say that I really don't think women have a green gene. And so I am not, uh, in that sense, very comfortable with that sort of essentialist argument that, you know, women inherently love nature and they're closer to nature because they menstruate and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I have seen, um, under certain very extreme circumstances, uh, women make decisions that are not uh, ecologically sound or environmentally friendly, but that's usually because they've been driven to the very, very depths of, of poverty and of lack of choices. But I have also seen women in multiple contexts resist the expedient, quicker buck route if they think that there's a sounder, more ecologically sustainable alternative. I've seen women in coastal Orissa turn down shrimp farming an extremely lucrative business because they recognized that the rice fields would get salinated and they'd never be able to grow rice again and be overruled by husbands who own the land saying, what do you mean? How can we turn down this income? And you know, frankly, I'm divided. I don't blame the men either. This may be their only chance at getting that kind of income, but that land is gone. Once you do shrimp farming, the land is gone. So there is a way in which women do prioritize more, more intergenerational interests. But most importantly, and I think this is the missing piece in reference to our earlier slide, women have huge reservoirs of ecological knowledge and skills. But because they don't have uh, validated, legitimate spaces uh, for that knowledge to be recognized, they use it in a very sort of quiet, subversive way. But the one that I love, which I've seen with my eyes, is uh, the, one of the projects I work with is um, the man tills, you know, he's, he's I'm sorry, he, he plows. And uh, she walks behind him, and she has this little kind of a sack pouch around her waist in which the seeds are. And what she has surreptitiously done is mixed uh, She's made two little pockets inside, and one side has this high-yielding lentil variety, and one side has this old strain, some seeds that she's conserved, which is a very tough, resilient strain. The yield isn't as high, but it resists, you know, drought, pests, etc. She has these two pouches, and he goes along, and she'll drop two of those and two of these. And he doesn't know, because he's walking ahead with the plow. Do you see? And to me, I was wishing I had a video camera watching this. Well, what happened a few months later was that the high yielding variety was hit by you know, a blight. There wasn't enough rainfall in that district. And it actually, most of that crop died. But this old grandmother seed, it actually bloomed and it gave them a crop and this guy's farm was the only one that had in the in that neighborhood that had uh, um, a harvestable uh, uh, crop 
And he got kind of suspicious and he said, how come they all planted that same seed that we planted but ours <laughs> didn't die? And that's when she said, well, actually, you know, I used this, this other one and I didn't want to tell you because I knew you'd get mad at me that I was wasting space on this old seed. But of course, thanks to that, they had a crop. So I think there are uh, really important ways in which we have to get beyond viewing women as, as instruments and as real reservoirs. So here's an optimist feminist view of what I think combining gender justice and envir environmental justice can actually yield. Because I think gender justice, if it works to liberate women, to have equal power and voice, if it breaks down these very uh, deeply embedded forms of discrimination, if it breaks the very gender divisions of labor, if it gives women control over resources and power in decision making, I think they can do really serious uh, 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 things in environmental regeneration and the sustainable management and use of natural resources because I've really seen them do it. And environmental justice hopefully will ensure the inclusion of women's voices and perspectives, not just as delivery systems, but in policy, in planning, in designing, in implementing, and assessing all the initiatives. And hopefully, that can actually create uh, a, a more just and sustainable world. I had a couple of sides, uh, slides here. Uh, going back to the history of the attempts to gender the environmental debate, but maybe I'll, I'll share those with you at a later point. Uh, this is a slide that I really wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time on because this is the way I look at how change processes occur and where are our strengths and weaknesses. So if I look at the gender justice, movements for gender justice, I think they've done great stuff in these two quadrants, the formal individual, changing laws that give women rights, changing laws to ensure that there is punishment for uh, uh, sexual violence, changing rape laws so that the burden of proof is not on the victim but on the per perpetrator, um, giving women uh, inheritance rights, changing divorce and maintenance and all kinds of personal laws. So that's been very well done, I think, by women's movements in even the fact that today there is a much greater uh, um, uh, recognition and we're struggling towards equality for uh, uh, sexual minorities, for gay and lesbian women to have a space and uh, a voice in various processes. So I think those have been some of the uh, achievements in the domain of the formal at the individual level. We've done great stuff at the formal systemic level. Okay, this quadrant has been our uh, real, um, the grist to our mill. Okay, we're good at getting policies. We've got global policies. We've got the Beijing Platform of Action. We've got CEDAW the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. We've got tons of global instruments and human rights has been gendered. And we've been quite effective at changing resource allocations at very macro levels. For instance, donors really taking on gender. That was the result of the women's movement's advocacy. It didn't happen because they woke up one day and decided to be nice to women. It's like Lincoln didn't free the slaves. So, you know, this is an, a domain in which we've been extremely uh, effective. The problem areas are in the domains of the individual informal and the systemic informal, because this is where gender inequality is persisting in countries like ours and in countries like yours, I might add. And this is where individual uh, uh, rights are actually negotiated. And I have a very interesting slide which I'll show you if the, if the question comes up of what does it take for a woman to access, for, for instance, healthcare. And when you look at those five walls or six walls she has to jump through over to get to healthcare, you see that's a lot about 
the informal domain operating at both the systemic and the individual level. But this is the key quadrant that we began to touch through our grassroots empowerment programs. This is where the consciousness raising, the strengthening women to challenge the ideologies that they themselves had internalized, all that work was really trying to address the norms, the practices, and the power structures in the informal but very so, uh, systemic domain. Now, if you look at environmental justice movements, it's not that different because you'll see that their main achievements have been in the formal systemic domain, where uh, all the protocols, the um, you know, legislations at the national and international level have been in, in that domain. So if you look at the creation of the EPA in your country, that's a formal systemic mechanism that was set up. Subsequently emasculated, subsequently disempowered, but it was created by environmental justice movements, by pressure and advocacy from that side. So it's, it's very useful to look at what's happening in any kind of change process through this um, kind of a lens and see where are we really working. Um, I wanted to quickly run over some of the challenges for global feminisms and environment movements, but I think I've already raised several of them. The need to develop non-instrumentalist and non-essentialist approaches and analyses, to begin to eschew the elitist definitions of, uh, uh, of rights and of the priorities, listening to women, asking how they experience the links, what their priorities are, making gender and environmental justice a much more critical and central part of their political agendas and their strategies. And I really think that feminisms do have to recast their frameworks. I think they have to, for instance, expand their notions of violence against women to include the violence of ecological uh, displacement and the struggle for natural resources, which very few groups currently uh, do embrace. And this is just an attempt to look at roles in achieving gender justice. And we could look at this as a, a, a proxy also for roles in achieving environmental justice. The state has a role, which is the enabling role, the enforcement role, providing resources, redress and support. And social change organizations have a role in awareness, mobilization, training, access to information providing certain kinds of services, but the most critical role is of women and their communities. So I want to place women as the very central actors um, uh, in, in, in these change processes. Um, I'm going to just uh, skip these, and these are some stories um, that I wanted to tell, um, but I don't think we have enough time. Um, this, is, this is kind of neat. Uh, because it's it's quite oops come back come back come back okay oh no I can't I can't do it I'm sorry you're just gonna have to uh, uh, wait for this but I was just trying here let's just see if we can get it up this way can you see it okay uh, just that some of the shifts that have to be made in the paradigm, I like to kind of um, single out like this. It's, it looks simplistic, but these are really profound transitions in the paradigm that is really moving from looking at women as victims to stakeholders. That's a very popular word these days. Uh, to not look at women as beneficiaries of changes, but as activists and architects of the change not looking as, at women as instruments, as means to uh, an end, but as leaders and agents of, uh, um, of change. I, I kind of like that. And then I wanted to end with this thought uh, from Amartya Sen, uh, one of my favorite male feminist advocates, I have to say. Uh, Amartya Sen says, Advancing gender equality through reversing the various social and economic handicaps 
that make women voiceless and powerless may also be one of the best ways of saving the environment and countering the dangers of overcrowding and other adversities associated with population pressure. He said this in the context of this whole argument that population is the population growth is the main reason for the degradation of the environment. The voice of women is critically important for the world's future and not just for women's future. Uh, I thought I'd stop there. So, thank you. Take five minutes to. <laughs> I don't know about you, but just after a talk, when I'm asked to ask questions, I get very like, oh dear, I have to ask a question and don't get a chance to really think what my question really is. So if you need time, I won't feel insulted if you don't raise your hand. Yes. You mentioned at the beginning uh, about the, the disparity in numbers. likely to be taken for treatment, um, they're le more likely to be overworked. In, in some Andhra Pradesh where Sonalini has done her field work, uh, there's a whole, and this is a much more widespread phenomenon, but it's become quite visible that uh, with the, it's the sun preference syndrome, but one of the new forms it's taking is, see, everybody wants their son to be educated and to get a good job. And earlier it used to be a government job. Now everybody wants their son to work in a software company. Because if you live outside a town like Hyderabad or Bangalore, that's what you see, or work in a call center. So this, this is percolation of this aspiration everywhere. And so one of the things that's happening is that girls are subsidizing the boys staying in school in laboring um, farm families by taking on more and more of the farm work that boys did earlier. So for example, they hand cast pesticide or fertilizer on the crops. And so they are now presenting with uh, neurological deficits in their digits. And of course, they are breathing and imbibing this. And there's a very, very high chance of sterility occurring in these girls. And if they become sterile, there's a very, very high chance they'll be subject to a lot of violence in the marital home. And uh, a high chance that then the husband will take a second wife or just throw her out and remarry because she can't produce children. You know, so it's a huge uh, cycle. So it's these ways also in which the sex ratio tends to decline. So I don't want to overemphasize that it's only because of sex selective abortion. But sex selective abortion is playing a growing role today. And there is a lot of documentation. It's banned in India. It's banned. When my daughter was pregnant, uh, she had to go to Bangkok to have her ultrasound done to know the sex of the child. But that's the tragedy. In rural areas, um, there are vans that just go village to village offering ultrasound uh, sex selection, um, sex detection, and then they'll, you know, take you to the nearest facility if you want to abort the child.
and in cities all the clinics will have big signs saying do not ask us to divulge the sex of the, your child, we are a disallowed by law etc etc. So maybe that was way more information than you asked for, but sorry. At the very beginning of your talk you, uh, you talked about equality for women and equity for women, the two different things that uh, you think are very important in gender justice. But what about the differences between men and women and between differently sexed individuals in terms of the law? I mean, gender justice seems to require us to pay attention to the differences and not simply to gloss them over under some notion of sameness. So how would you address that issue? And in fact, that's exactly why I was making the distinction between uh, sameness and equal opportunity because you can't have sameness in everything and we don't want it. But we want sameness in some realms. For example, regardless of my sexual preference, I believe, that's my personal belief, I should have the right to marry, for example. I don't see why I should not have the same rights to a long-term partnership with a person I want to be with because I'm not heterosexual, for example. I'm always scared of raising these issues in, in, in the South. I know that <laughs> these are not popular issues in the American South. But yeah, so there I think sameness matters because it's a sameness that transcends that difference. It's not negating that difference. It's saying you can be different, but when it comes to your right to vote, for example, I, let's take the right to vote. That's a good example, actually. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter whether you pay taxes or not. This is what the Indian Constitution decided. Long before, I might add, many developed countries' constitutions did. It said people can have a right to vote because they're citizens of India. Literacy level doesn't matter. Uh, income status doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter. Caste doesn't matter. Religion doesn't matter. You have a right to vote. So there, it's not negating the difference, it's transcending it and saying in the eyes of the Constitution, you are all the same with regard to this right. Okay, so it's about sameness in reference to a right that I have. It doesn't say that you and I are the same or that uh, a, a Dalit woman and an upper caste man are the same. That's not what it's saying, but it's giving them the same right. Okay. Equality of opportunity is really addressing difference because that's where, for example, all our affirmative action come in. It says our constitution actually allows the government, it mandates the government to take affirmative action to redress historical injustices to certain sections of our people. So people have tried, actually some men have tried to challenge um, equal em employment opportunities, uh, to challenge affirmative action in the workplace. And I know this has happened in the US too, that's why I'm drawing this parallel by saying this is a violation of my right to equality under you know, Article 16, Article 14 of the Constitution of India, which guarantees non-discrimination. You're discriminating in favor of this person because he's Dalit or because it's a woman. And that has always been struck down by our Supreme Court because our Constitution empowers and in fact mandates the government to take action to redress historical wrongs. So it says that the government can do something for me because I'm a woman or because I am from an oppressed caste uh, without violating the principle of equality under law. Do you see what I mean? So that one is kind of actually dealing with difference, but it's saying we want to redress difference where it discriminates or um, imbalances access and opportunity. It's just that if you're going to deal with uh, difference uh, in terms of equity of opportunity, you're going to have to deal with difference at the level of law as well. 
Sure. Right. So sure. I, I was just having trouble with the way that you with those two levels. Yeah. So okay. You, you talked about equality as being a legal equality and equity being a. Uh, you see what I'm saying? A, a, a equity of opportunity, and I was thinking that. Well, it's not just legal. I'm 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 actually saying, and and please, I'd love to debate this more with you because I'd like to learn how you look at it. What I'm saying is that in certain situations, sameness is very important to me. I don't want to be treated differently because I'm different on the basis of my gender or my caste or my uh, race or nationality or whatever. Yeah? Question. So it's not what just the, legal. What the, what the standard of, of the equal is, that is all I'm saying. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's an interesting question, and we should unpack that a bit more. I don't have an answer to it, but I feel challenged by that question. It's really good. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, in one of the earlier slides, we didn't speak about it, but it talked about new forms of violence against women. There toward the end, you talked about expanding our notion of violence against women to include um, environmental justice kinds of issues. And I, I just wish you would speak a little more about that. <laughs> but, you know, you sort of touched it, but... Yeah. Um, and you know, there's much content in this that right. I didn't want to bore you guys to death. <laughs> but um, that one was actually something that I did uh, illustrate in another slide, which is I talked about the four to five hours a day right. that women in some areas are now having to go to gather uh, firewood. I'm sorry, I'm showing my back to you guys. Um, that is a new form of violence because they're hungry. They uh, often have to go early morning on an empty stomach. There are a lot of health impacts. They get hookworm through the uh, cracks in their feet. So they get infestations that further eat up the limited food that they're eating. And, and so to me, that is a new form of violence that is occurring. That's violence on their bodies. This head loading is violence on their bodies. The lack of sleep, you know. Uh, a lot of women in, in our um, small consciousness raising groups that we used to have when we were building, building the village level women's collectives used to talk about, we used to have this dream session, you know. If you could redesign your day to just be exactly how you want, how would it look? And it's interesting, if they were landless agricultural labor, they would always say, we would like to be in an artisanal family. Because that is seen as not as tiring and exhausting work, because you don't have to go and sit in the field and work. You can help with the pottery, prepare the clay, or help with preparing this, doing the spinning. They can't touch the loom. They're not allowed to weave, but they can do spinning and so on. And one of the other things they always raised is, I want to be able to sleep more. Mm -hmm. I want more sleep. And it sounds like a very weird thing you know, to, to raise in this context. But uh, actually, there's a very interesting study that was done in the 80s um, by a, a, an old friend and colleague who's worked a lot on, on women's health issues and on reproductive health. In a, in a rural area just outside Pune, which is quite a big city near Bombay. And um, when they surveyed the village, they did sort of occupational profiles in each household. And she found a large number uh, of men just kind of sitting around and uh, you know, relaxing in the courtyard or whatever. And you know the the women were being interviewed. Well, 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 what's happened to him? Oh no, he's not well. And then when they went back and looked at the data, they found that like 15 percent, or uh, between 15 and 20 percent of households, the women said there's this man who's not well, this husband or father-in-law or whoever. So they got suspicious, and they went back and they started interrogating this and saying, "Well, what happened? What happened?" It would often turn out, it, at least 50% of those cases, it turned out that this man had at some point, three years earlier or five years earlier, had TB or you know, some, some serious illness or had broken a limb or whatever, and had had to stay at home to be treated and, and recover and convalesce. 
During this convalescence made the great discovery that he got his liquor, he got his BDs, you know, the hand rolled cigarettes, he got money to, if he demanded it, to go play uh, cards with his friends at the village liquor shop or tea shop or whatever. And he got his meals. And you know, boy, I could do this longer term. This is good. So more women in the house would, and often daughters would, who were often kept at home if they were particularly at that prepubescent age group, they start going out and doing wage labor with the mother to bring in that extra income. And this, this is the new dispensation. He never goes back to work. That is a form of violence for me. It's a very passive form of violence because it's imposing huge new burdens of labor on, on the women in the household. So when I say expanding our frameworks, I mean, I think we have to think beyond just domestic violence, A. But I think women's groups have done that to a great extent. They've moved beyond domestic violence. They've They've been very good at addressing certain types of systemic violence, which is like rape and war situations and sexual violence committed by state authorities, you know, um, and police and so on, custodial rape and so on. But because this larger perspective is often lacking, I think they've stopped short of becoming advocates on these kinds of less visible forms of violence. But with women, that's why I say listen to women, but really hear what they're saying. I want to sleep more. Is she lazy? No, she's saying she needs more rest because her days are 16 hours long or 18 hours long. Yes? <laughs> stories um, that we had to speak through at the end. Um, in particular, I'm interested in um, examples of how you think these challenges, I mean, I'm, you preface this by saying, no, it's going to be hard, we're going to be hard pressed to find examples of women's organizations who, who are working um, in these kinds of examples that you're talking about. But, um, but you did speed past some um, examples of women's activism, and where do you think they've come the closest, or they've been best able to be effective? Um, shall I? If you can, because you may have fallen asleep. <laughs> well, I at least need to look at the notes, even if I, if I can't project them. But this is one of my absolute favorite uh, stories. And it's really come out of uh, a project that's um, This was one of the other Mahila Samakya projects. It's the same project that I ran in Karnataka, but it was running in three states at that time. So um, this was in, in UP, which is a northern state. And as you know, where the sex ratios are very bad, uh, it's, a, it's a very feudal. Uh, it keeps going back to the first slide. I think I put in a setting which I need to remove, which is. I need to deselect this. And it won't let me select that. OK. Hopefully, it will work now. So um, one of the key things that they encountered in, in this area was, you know, one of the environmentally very degrading things that the government of India has done because of this kind of populist context in which they're trying to uh, win votes is to get the, um, solve the hunger for water in rural areas by just putting in all these bore wells. And what the bore wells have done is, um, I wish I had the numbers with me, they've sucked out and depleted the underground water table in, uh, in a pretty devastating way. And they're predicting, well, 
or the whole world is going to face a water crisis that will make gas look cheap in comparison. But the point is that in India, the water table has gone down already by about two thirds its level in uh, 1950. But the water pumps have been a very good thing for getting safe drinking water to villages. The problem is that the water table is not being replenished by environmental management measures, you know, rainwater harvesting and watershed development and so on. So what these people did, the, the women working in this area, they were started organizing the Dalit women, the extremely poor women, and every single one of them had uh, uh, the same thing to say, which is the first issue we want to work on is getting the water pumps fixed. Because what would happen is this kind of lever that you have to move like this to get the spout to yield water, and that lever always breaks or it jams, and then the water pump is useless. So they said that we are not allowed to draw well, uh, well water because we are Dalits, we are untouchables. So we at least need these water pumps to work. But there was this whole situation in which men from the villages and primarily middle caste, middle caste men had been trained as water pump mechanics. So they couldn't, to get them to come and fix the uh, pump meant that they had to pay a bribe. Because this is part of this sort of all pervasive percolation of corruption. So everybody figures out some way to make some extra money. So although they were paid as hand pump mechanics by government, they were also extracting bribes from communities to fix the wells. So the project leaders took um, the very radical decision that they were going to train the women as hand pump mechanics. So they first did a fairly long and painful process of negotiating with the state water authority to get them to accept that women could be trained to maintain these hand pumps, A. So that's breaking the gender division of labor. But it's also breaking the caste division of labor by saying that Dalit women would fix the hand pumps. And uh, the uh, officials said nobody will touch water from those wells. So these women said, all the better, you know, more water for the Dalits <laughs> women. But please, 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 they begged and they negotiated and they got them to agree and they did a series of trainings for the women. Now these hand pump mechanics, and there are wonderful pictures of them, I should actually put the pictures up. They are in their traditional garment, you know, the Eastern UP type of um, thing. And they have this big like a mini apron tied around their waist with all these tools. But the way they are marching is very different from, you know, how they would have normally walked. But over time, to cut a long story short, not only did they end up repairing all the broken pumps and, uh, you know, making sure that they were in good working order because they worked out these interesting rosters of, you know, you do a round today and I'll do the round tomorrow and that sort of thing. But they also broke through the caste barrier because initially upper caste women and middle caste women were told you can't touch water from that well. But, you know, everybody needs water. So that broke down, that taboo broke down very fast and people started drawing water from those wells. But these women also became, you know, major role models. And from repairing the hand pumps, they got into all the issues around the water table, how do we regenerate it, how do we raise the water level in the underground water table, because if we lose access to this water, we are dead, you know, this is our key drinking water supply. And they saw how it had reduced infectious diseases, reduced infant mortality and child mortality from infectious diseases. Their own, you know, health was better because they weren't getting so many gastric um, in um, GI tract infections. But also, these women suddenly started becoming kind of key decision makers in the Dalit community. And over time, many of them have become leaders in what is the new na uh, is a, the, a network that has emerged in that area called the Dalit Mahila Vikas Samiti, uh, the DMVS. And they have become 
very powerful and influential women in the community. And now they are starting on this whole uh, sort of initiative to try and green the uh, water management process in the area. Among other things, they're also, they've also become uh, very popular arbitrators in, in, in disputes, especially domestic disputes. They hold, you know, like women's panchayats, they call them, you know, like women's courts. So there's been a very, you know, gender justice and the environmental justice piece marching together. It's quite interesting. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah, With Madhvi? Okay. So you should be answering. You no, should be actually, telling this. I've, I've sort of heard that story so many times, and it still gives me chills, because those are some of the most exciting times in, in sort of our, you know, career in Bangla. So I think that's the exciting part of it. Yes. And I kind of like your narrative of what's happening about it, but I think there's also the other narrative, which is that, you know, close to 26 women have graduated in the Hanford Training Program. And, and when I was doing only about five of them are still practicing. So I think for me, the question then becomes, well, what is this other family's problem that we need to kind of look at mm. in terms of sustainability? Mm. Because I think the Mega Samakya program sort of did do a paradigm shift in terms of how women make policy changes for women. Mm. But I think when you're talking about the failures of Mega Samakya, right. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I am thinking myself in that because I work for the which is an urban NGO, right, which was very much involved in Yeah. yeah. Right. And to me, the question was, so what do you move on to? You know, right. And you don't think Banangana took <laughs> some of that slack? Um, I think Banangana was, was another NGO that sort of separated itself from Mela Samakya in interesting ways because Banangana decided not to take education up at all. It said the literacy and education is mm -hmm. not. Hmm. to my Lhasa Makya, where you know, education is considered for empowerment, and one of said, we want to stay away from it, we want to do self-help groups, we want to do microcredit. And to me, that interesting talks about the, the story of the international discourse and its shifting nature. Right? I mean, education was so powerful in the 1980s and you know, early 1990s, and then it changed. No, but it was not popular with the feminism at that time. Oh, so as I remember when uh, we were initially launching My La Samakya, having some very interesting, well, acrimonious, why am I calling them interesting? Acrimonious debates uh, with some of my uh, feminist colleagues from the autonomous women's groups, like Delhi and Bombay, uh, over the issue of why am I doing literacy? And uh, it was actually a very interesting, in, in retrospect, an essentialist argument, which said that they should remain in the pristine purity of their oral tradition, and while the rest of us can surf the internet. And they were so uncognizant of the power dynamic that they were reproducing and taking that position, you know. I mean, I'm very happy to protect and nurture the oral tradition. To me, that's a whole different issue. But if you say to me, I have to keep them in the oral tradition, but I have access to all the other traditions. I have access to the written word. I have access today. I mean, in the early 90s, of course, we hadn't heard of the internet. But all the doors that literacy does open for you in terms of accessing uh, information, to me, that was just so intuitively objectionable. 
And to me, it was a very typical reproduction of the north-south paradigm within our country. You know, they must remain oral, they must sing songs and tell stories around the fire, you know. So it was like orientalizing poor women uh, while, you know, you're going to international conferences and, and reading, uh, you know, Judy Brass and Joni Seeger and Brooke Ackerley and <laughs> Srilata Bhatliwala. So, yeah, I think those are some of the hard questions inside. So I think everybody's tired. Shall we invite everyone to our reception? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.